their summits battered by freezing winds, the South American Andes are amongst the most dangerous mountains in the world. Attempts at crossing them by hot air balloon have failed, some in near death. Yet one man found the challenge irresistible. From the summit of Everest to the North and South Poles, David Hempelman Adams has survived against all odds. Yet the Andes balloon crossing would be his ultimate test. Over the years, I've done 32 expeditions, and I've done the Grand Slam, you know, Everest, North Pole, South Pole. Um, but without question, this is going to be the most dangerous thing that I've ever done. Partly because um, we're not as experienced in this field uh, as mountaineering and polar travel. Uh, and notwithstanding that, there must be a reason why no one's ever gone across the Andes. There were many reasons. Flying at 26,000 feet in an open wicker basket, a balloonist can freeze to death in temperatures of minus 40. He can die in minutes through lack of oxygen or get tangled in violent winds tumbling thousands of feet over the summits, which can tear a balloon apart or slam it into the rocks. Once you start to get near these high summits, you're getting this curl over effect. And I've heard that for 10 years, you know, it's impossible to do, you can't do this. Anything's possible as long as you put your mind to it. It was during their two-month trek to the North Pole that the Swindon businessman and his companion Runa Yeldness began planning their next big adventure combining a balloon crossing of the Andes with a record-breaking high-altitude parachute jump by Runa. Runa thinks it's the most dangerous thing he's ever done. So notwithstanding the seven summits and the poles and things, uh, I think we both feel this, this is uh, calling in all our chips. Having hatched the idea, David had a small problem. He'd never flown a balloon. He began training for his pilot's license to tackle one of the world's most dangerous balloon challenges as a relative novice. Survival would depend on the backup of an expert ground crew. Uh, I'm taking uh, a very experienced man called Terry McCoy, who taught me to fly. We're not going out with a view. Um, it's never been done. Let's go out and get a new record lap. We've, we've talked to the best people in the world. God, it's wet. The reason why this really appealed to me is it's ballooning, but it's an element of adventure. It's, it's, it's something that no one's done before. And it's an open basket, so it's not a pressurized capsule like around the world things. So we'll be totally open to the elements. Because of that, we're going to be going up to 25, 26,000 feet, and we need oxygen. The lack of oxygen at extreme altitude is a problem not just for the pilot. Things can go horribly wrong with the burners. And of course, because there's less oxygen, you get the pilot lights going out. So we're taking special burners down there. And it's very, very simple um, technology of balloon. It's hot air, you go up, and when you don't put the burners on, you come down. Simple as that, and you go with the wind. churches, railway lines, roads. 
It's just very simple, but it's essential. Okay, we've got this main road coming up through. God, I'm traveling fast. Traveling fast. Okay, get into your crash position. We got up and it was very fast, it was about 20 knots, so we were going very, very quick. We were the only balloon up today, which is an indication we were probably pushing it a bit. Are we in a red area, Bruno? We are in a red area. We're just going to say no landing. Go on a bit further, then we would have got into line and near space. Okay, tell me if there's any power lines across there, Runa. No, we knew it was going to be a hard landing because we had to get into this field. We've got power lines just behind. Get into crash position now because we're going to hit those trees, I think. And uh, so I just clipped the tree and came, pulled hard and came straight in. Are you holding on? Yeah. Crash position. Which was. Uh, exactly what we did. Hold on. Hold it. Good skid marks, always good to, to get the passengers uh, adrenaline going. <laughs> and um, didn't lose anyone overboard, so that was good for me. Climbing Everest, David Hempelman Adams had experienced the effects of oxygen starvation and reduced air pressure but his body had had weeks to acclimatize. In a balloon, he'd reached the same altitude in minutes. It could be fatal. Climbing 4,000 feet. To find out what could happen, he and Runa enter a decompression chamber. Air is pumped out to simulate atmospheric conditions at 25,000 feet. We then remove individual's oxygen supply at that altitude and ask them to carry out tasks which are easy um, at sea level. 25,000 feet, the chamber is stable. Right, here we go. Masks coming off the brakes. Timing. OK, do the jigsaw. His ability to do the jigsaw puzzle was definitely slowed as time went on, and probably more importantly, you could see that he had increasing difficulty in actually picking up the pieces of the jigsaw, even though they were large, easily handleable pieces. Two minutes, 15. Okay, put your arms up to you. OK. Good, there's quite a big tremor there. The tremor is a sign of oxygen starvation. David's mask is replaced. The experiment shows that if his oxygen fails high over the mountains, he'll have less than three minutes before he's mentally incapable of fixing it. Back on oxygen, he quickly recovers. Are you back on oxygen yet? Uh, yeah. Do you remember it going back on? Uh, no. What really is scary is how fast you go, and you can feel yourself consciously be able to do something and then gradually slowly going if I was by myself I would never have put the mask on so it was important uh, just to go through that it's just you're just on your way out of this world uh, at least in the end of it <laughs> is this the type of material that we'll be using on the yeah that's that's exactly the one um, at the cameron factory in bristol david gets an update on his balloon 
and technical advice on oxygen equipment. Be, uh, about 161 minutes, so say 160 minutes of useful oxygen from that tank. If you go above 34,000 feet, then you need 100% um, oxygen. We've got something wrong right. if we don't. <laughs> but in any event, as long as you've got this mask on, then you're probably not going to go hypoxic. The balloon will have a traditional wicker basket like that used by Don Cameron in 1972, when he became the first man to cross the Alps by hot air balloon, braving dangerous winds over the summits. The wind is stronger at altitude, of course, and then when it hits the solid landmass, um, it, it flows over the top and then can go into uh, curling currents, which are very heavy turbulence. It would be possible to lose so much lift that uh, the balloon would hit the ground before it could be recovered. And uh, this has happened. It's very important to stay higher than the mountain tops, maybe giving them two or 3,000 feet to, to stay absolutely clear of the curl over. Yeah, so what we're looking at Maintaining is Maintaining altitude sort of depends on the propane burners, which the fill the balloon with hot air. If they fail, it'll immediately lose height, possibly getting caught in the destructive so turbulence below. At high altitude, the pilot lights could be snuffed out by lack of oxygen. The inbuilt ignition system might not be enough to relight them. And so just an emergency pickup, if these pretzos aren't working, yeah. and you've got your Strike weld in. And you stick that straight in through there in the normal way, but you pick up... As emergency backup, David will carry a welder's spark gun to relight the burners. You just stick it through in there, and that'll give you a flame. It was only after talking to them and they think it can be done that we thought well let's give it a try what's the poem about them back home near swindon david prepares to say farewells yet again the girls are used to not seeing their adventurous dad for months on end you know in this household it is it is normal we don't he goes off and does trips and the children do things with him now and it's just ordinary ordinary way of life to them you didn't go to school either. Why didn't you go to school? <coughs> Not your day at school, is it? Uh, when you're in the middle of the Arctic, or on the top of Everest, or in the middle of anywhere, jungle, you just can't get on a telephone and phone home. So the nice thing about this trip, at least, we'll be able to keep in very good communication. What have you got to do then? They enjoy it as well. They enjoy getting involved being able to do all the things that other children don't do. Although lately I find it quite difficult to fi find out or work out where he is and where he's going or where he has been even. Or the full extent of the risk involved. What I tend to do is tell her some details but n not all the salient points. So um, I've been trying to get her up into a hot air balloon and she refuses at the moment. So. Um, maybe when we get back, we'll take her up in a, in a balloon. But um, no, I haven't told her all the details. But no one can foresee the full details of what the Andes have in High above the Chilean capital of Santiago, the Andes rise to a height of 23,000 feet, the world's highest mountains outside the Himalayas. Even with favorable winds, the balloon crossing will involve a dangerous high altitude flight of more than 100 miles, landing in Argentina. Well, we're in Santiago at the moment, Chile. This is the spine of the Andes, which separates Chile and Argentina. And if the weather is perfect, we get these winds coming off the Pacific, and we would like to go to a place called Los Andes here. This will be our launch site and the prevailing wind should take us up to Aconcagua here and then over the spine of the Andes and landing in this low plateau down there in Argentina. Preparations begin with a test flight at low altitude to check equipment and iron out technical problems. 
Hoping to set a new altitude record for a parachute landing, Runa must rehearse his exit from the basket. Okay, cut this off. Well, it was getting used to the burners, uh, the different burners, and getting Runa up there, practicing getting out on the basket. He stands on the edge of the, the basket, and um, I clip on his survival equipment underneath his parachute, and we were happy with that. The test flight clears up a mystery of the previous failed attempts. Laden with navigational and oxygen equipment, the balloon is too heavy to complete the crossing before it runs out of fuel. At this precise moment, we wouldn't make it. And that's probably one of the reasons why no one's done it before. Uh, we're using very light titanium tanks, uh, a new envelope. So we've got everything to the minimum weight. Uh, and we're still finding uh, we're 100 pounds overweight. And if we have any chance of doing it, we have to get rid of that 100 pounds somehow. Finding weight savings won't be easy. The balloon must carry heavy kit, including a transponder, to signal its position to air traffic control. She's carrying extra things like normally you wouldn't carry on a flight, like the oxygen and the parachute, and you know, because the room is going to jump out of the balloon. And we say the parachute, I think, weighs about 30 kilos. You know, that's a lot of weight to carry as extra on top of everything else. The team must take drastic measures. The floor panel of the wicker basket is removed, along with a fairing around the mouth of the envelope. Every available ounce is trimmed off until the balloon is down to weight. The team is all set when suddenly they're grounded. The normally reliable west wind swings round to the east. It would now blow the balloon out to the Pacific Ocean. For five days, the team can do nothing but wait. Well, the situation is good in, in terms of wind direction for tomorrow morning, but the highest winds will be 15 knots, 1.5 for tomorrow. 15 knots is too slow. The balloon might run out of fuel while still high over the mountains. But the wind direction is good, and it might be their only chance. It's an agonizing decision. It's not a decision, David, but I think that this very marginal. Maybe um, we can have 15 minutes, just me and you, private. Yes. Okay. The fuel and weight calculations are checked and rechecked. They're still marginal. But after tomorrow, the weather prospects are even worse. Um, the situation is not good uh, uh, except for uh, Monday. And Monday, just in the morning, uh, to cross uh, the Andes Mountains. Uh, the rest of the next week will be uh, bad winds. It's a tough call. David's survival depends on getting it right. He calculates the risk. Victor is nervous. He believes the danger is too great. It's really too marginal. Hey, you're right. We have to not go. We can't go. I think we're starting to realize why no one else has done it now. Um, we've got problems with the wind direction. Um, tomorrow, it looks okay for the wind direction, but the speed of the wind is such that um, it's very, very marginal to the point at the moment we couldn't do it. You need a good wind speed to cover the distance over the Andes. The problem is if you're becalmed on the top, um, you're in the middle of nowhere. It's very, very rare that you would get a day like this. Maybe five days a year would be the maximum. Well, they've had five. 
consecutive days, which they've never ever had. Well, we can see Aconcagua, beautiful sight, and that's the mountain we've got to get across. And um, what's frustrating is the Met people say uh, there's no wind today, that's the forecast, and there's a plume off the summit, so there's obviously wind on the top, and that's quite frustrating. And they said there was zero wind in the, in the valley. And as you can see all around by the trees, it's, it's quite um, a gusty wind um, and it's going in the right direction. So you can have all this technology and sometimes, you know, it can let you down. So it is a bit frustrating. It's really in the lap of the gods. You make a silent little prayer sometimes. We came to Santa Teresa and we're just hoping she'll give us a little bit of luck with the wind. Three days later, another weather update. Perfecto. Okay, muchas gracias. Muy amable. Winds from the west between 25 to 35 knots at 20,000 and 25,000 feet. You will have the chance to fly over the summit, more or less, straight to the summit. Tomorrow? Tomorrow. But tomorrow will not go as planned. I have to make a urgent landing, Eagle. The South American Andes are amongst the highest mountains in the world. Previous attempts at crossing them by hot air balloon have ended in near death. Yet David Hempelman Adams found their challenge irresistible. Without question, this is going to be the most dangerous thing that I've ever done in a ballooning adventure against all odds. The attempt begins before dawn. Unlike a helium balloon which can fly around the world, David's hot air balloon burns propane to stay airborne. It can carry barely enough fuel for the 100-mile flight over the Andes into Argentina. If it runs out, it could crash in the mountains. A heavy fuel burn will be needed climbing to more than 25,000 feet to avoid violent winds over the summits, which could tear the balloon apart. Get it, boy, the tank. OK? Oh. Yes? Oh. David takes off with companion Rooney Yeldness on board. Santiago Radio, Santiago Radio, Golf Bravo, Yankee Delta Juliet. Rooney hopes to achieve the world's highest parachute landing by skydiving onto one of the mountain summits. At high altitude, he'll have just five seconds to stabilize and pull his ripcord. This low altitude training jump will test whether he can do it. The test drop is a success. It won't be so easy at 26,000 feet. Now flying alone, 
David needs oxygen as the balloon climbs. At higher altitude, the wind is supposed to be blowing east across the Andes. But so far, the balloon is still being blown north towards the busy air lanes of Santiago Airport. The helicopter pilot alerts David to an approaching jet. We have some traffic. We have a 737 coming into uh, ILS approach to Arturo Vino Benitez. We're 13,000. Climbing to 18,000 feet, the balloon has still not picked up the easterly wind. If it drifts further off course, it won't have enough fuel left for the mountain crossing. The propane burners start spluttering in the rarefied air. Making adjustments to keep the burners going, David climbs to 20,000 feet. The helicopter pilot is concerned that he's still off course. He's going northeast. If he doesn't get some west wind, he's gonna end up near San Juan. At 25,000 feet, the temperature is minus 40. The helicopter cannot fly this high. Okay, how are you doing? Uh, flight level 280. 280? Oh, we can't get up there. And at 30,000 feet. At 30,000 feet, air pressure is less than half that at sea level. Like a diver getting the bends, David could now be stricken by nitrogen bubbles forming in his bloodstream. And if his oxygen should fail, he'll have only minutes to live. There's an ominous radio silence. David, uh, I know it's it's hard sometimes to talk with the oxygen, but um, do you, you have any ground speed indication? Come on, man. Well, I, I, it's everything okay. Well, uh, I'm a little bit concerned about this guy. I think maybe he's too high without having a pressurized cabin. After several nervous minutes, radio silence is broken. Mario! I have to make an urgent landing, Diego. Urgent landing? I have to oxygen. It's frozen. The oxygen is frozen. Okay, I understand you're doing an emergency landing. Uh, your oxygen is frozen. I try to come down fast, man. It's the nightmare scenario. At 31,000 feet without oxygen, David will lose consciousness in about three minutes. He needs 12 minutes to get down. Okay, David, how are you doing? Now try to come down real fast. You don't have too much time. To get down before he blacks out, David takes the gamble of his life. He lets the balloon go cold. It plummets at 2,000 feet a minute, three times the normal safe speed. He's coming down fast. The whole thing was just revolving around as I was going down. And also there was wind shear coming in to the, the pilot lines, so the, the pilot lines were blowing out as well. And I thought, um, blind, I've maybe come down a bit too quick and um, I might have lost the plot there a bit. Now heading for the rocks, the balloon is so cold it's losing shape. The envelope is beginning to collapse. At last, David gets the burners relit with his welder's spark gun. But after the emergency descent, he's traveling too fast. Ah, uh -huh. you almost burned the balloon. The balloon's forward speed blows the flame sideways into the fabric. Uh, David, uh, where are you heading? I was starting to track back in to the cliffs. And I thought, um, I didn't like that. Are you able to climb over this mountain? If he wants to get up, it's better.
But it was certainly nice to have human contact and know that if you're going to hit the deck that you can actually talk to someone before you do it. To steer him away from the rocks, David has an idea. Harry, if you come up behind and maybe the turbulence will take me into the valley, over. Okay, I'll try and see that, how that works. It's one thing I haven't done in all my life, pushing balloons, but it's time to start. The pilot flies close to the balloon, trying to use the downdraft from his rotors to blow it away from the cliffs. The balloon drifts away from the rocks and towards the valley below. started drifting in and uh, drifted straight into the, the biggest cactus plant I've ever seen in my life. Four knots of cactus. I was lucky to get away with that one. Lovely landing. <laughs> one of my better ones. We found from our training uh, prior to the expedition that at 31,000 feet you're gonna lose consciousness in minutes and uh, I was running out of oxygen so I didn't want to keep going because I knew one I wouldn't be able to land in the mountains and two I'd be dead because you lose consciousness and that's it from his training in a decompression chamber David knew he hadn't long to live I could feel myself going and fighting uh, fighting for it and des I put the spear, I tried to unfreeze the cylinder up here, but uh, I just couldn't do it. David greets the helicopter pilot who helped guide him down. But it was good to talk to her. <laughs> when you said, uh, get down quick. Yeah. Right. I knew it. We trained before. Oh, you did? Yeah, in a chamber. chamber. And then all of a sudden, all these kids started to appear, and I thought, God, you know, where do they come from? The children of Elsa Branti have run a mile from their Andean village school to help. They pick off sharp cactus spines, which have torn the fabric. In places, it's badly burned by the flames. It may be too damaged to fly again. Back in Santiago, the team reviews tactics. What has gone wrong with Chile's prevailing easterly wind? I was reliably informed that the prevailing winds are always out, out from the Pacific, straight east, and, and they always do that every day. And we've been down here 12 days, and it's happened twice. So very, very unusual weather pattern. South America's west coast is baking in one of its hottest and driest summers on record. The Andes have had a virtually snowless winter. Many believe the lack of mountain snowfall is a warning that ocean currents deep in the nearby Pacific, which affect weather patterns worldwide, are being changed by global warming, a sign that industrial pollution is altering our climate. Unable to rely on the easterly wind, the team changes tactics. Our first flight was from Los Andes, a little town just outside of the Andes. Uh, but it's about 60 miles north from here, from Santiago. And, and that's, that causes a lot of time delay because you've got to get up there, get everything organized. Now we're going to fly out of Santiago, and that gives us very, very uh, quick.
quicker response time. So if at four o'clock in the morning uh, we get a, a good forecast, we're off. We're, we're not missing a day and we're not missing a slot in the weather. But I'm pretty confident now that we're going to get a slot and we're going to go. For Runa, there's bad news. To increase his chances of success, the team decides David must make the next flight alone. The parachute attempt is off. But there's better news about the balloon. Repairs to the burnt and torn fabric have passed an airworthiness test. Damage to the fabric was caused by the spine of the cactus. See the envelope here? It was just two, one inch small, but we decided to change a large piece of the fabric to be sure that everything will be safe for the next flight. Modifications to the oxygen equipment ensure it will not fail again. After four days, the wind starts swinging east. The recovery crew head for Argentina, hoping that's where they'll next see the balloon after its hazardous flight. I did say it's probably the most dangerous thing I've done, and the reason why is things can go wrong rapidly. And, OK, mountaineering, you can have an avalanche and, and that's it. But um, hopefully you've got enough skill to avoid avalanches. And polar stuff, you, hopefully you've got enough skill to avoid the water and things. Those are the big dangers. Whereas this, um, you know, you can have a technical fault or something that you don't even think about. And it just goes wrong very, very quickly. In no time at all, you're losing a 1,000 feet a minute. Well, within five minutes, you're into the top of a mountain. And if you're tracking at 45 knots into the top of a mountain, um, I, think it, I think it would be a hard landing. At last, the team can try again. The wind is in the right direction and should be fast enough to carry the balloon across the Andes before it runs out of fuel. climb quite quickly, but there was very little wind. Seeing the, the sun rise above the Andes in an open basket, a wicker basket, okay, it was cold, minus 20, and you, you could see the condensation, but there was something absolutely magical about it, fantastic. 24,000 feet, track of 113, speed 36 knots. You don't seem to be getting any closer to these mountains. So I just thought, well, you've just got to keep going up and up and up. And once I got up to 25,000, I started picking up speed and the right track. I gradually started to see the longitude started to chunk down. And when I started to actually see that, that was a, an enormous relief. And then when I got up to about 31,000, I got up there again. I started to track about 45 knots, which was fantastic. You can look down and see that you were covering the mountains. I wasn't as busy as the first flight, but I was very busy, but it was so very beautiful. Suddenly, there's a problem. David has switched to a new gas cylinder. The burner has gone out and won't relight. The siren warns that the balloon is on its way down. And then I was trying desperately to get this uh, pilot light to go with my welding starting torch, and it just wouldn't go. And I started, the, the siren started again, and I started coming down. And unlike the, on the Monday, where I was um, to the west of the Andes, uh, here I was right smack in the middle of these very sharp peaks, just like the Alps. Although I had about 10,000 foot clearance, um, I was going down quick, so I thought, Jesus. Several frantic minutes later, 
David tries again. And it was immense relief after that, just fantastic relief after that. Yeah, high ring is going to be down here somewhere. Let level two zero zero. Clip of 108. Speed 28 knots. After three hours at up to 31,000 feet, David is over Argentina. Mountain peaks begin to give way to flat plain where he can land. The first hot air balloon crossing of the Andes is almost achieved. The Andes are such that you come out of the mountains and then it's just flat ground. I will be landing in 30 minutes, 30 minutes. From that altitude, 31,000, there was just a couple little farm hamlets. And I started to make a descent towards those hamlets. And everywhere else, as far as the eye could see, there was just this bush. And I thought, if I landed in anywhere over there, it would take me two weeks to get out of it. Right, for our position, I will find you on the map. Thanks. Over. Roger. Bueno, paradita, chilecito. Ustedes quieren ver el campo. ¿Qué buscan ustedes? Okay, that's the Andes behind me. But as the sun heats the mountains, rising currents of air cause the wind to reverse. The balloon stops moving forwards and starts to go back. The wind's taking me back into the mountains. So I'm going to try and punch it into that little bit of land down there. So I'm coming down fast, 9,500 feet now. I'm going to miss that town over there because uh, 9 o'clock it's late, thermals are coming and I'm going back into the mountains. Chile, Quito. Uh, small town on the map, OK? It's, it's a good 30 miles south of where we thought he would be. Recovering the balloon could take hours. This is remote and difficult terrain. 7,000 feet. He should be there or thereabouts now. Uh, he's certainly into an Argentinian airspace. That's the town they re he reckon he's going to aim for, and he's going to be in that sort of area there. He's done 90 miles. Uh, Roger, Tim, uh, 10 minutes from landing. Over. Came down to 1,000 uh, feet above the ground and saw this track and put it down very close to this uh, track. Come on, my baby. Thank you. Thank you very much for looking after me. Good girl. Did you notice how unchirpy he was this morning? <laughs> He's very chirpy now. Yo! Yo, 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 yo! I had a feeling like to cry, something like that. Uh, the foothills of the Andes. So, there we are. Fantastic. Fantastic. Truly fantastic. This is my friends, my amigos, and his wife. And they're going to take me up to the road. And I can tell you, it's very nice to see Human contact again. This is Argentina. Muchas gracias, señor. 
it took three and a half hours for the flight, and I think it took five hours to retrieve the, the uh, basket in the envelope. This is yours as well. London Day. A shampoo. Great man. Brilliant. Brilliant. Fantastic. Wonderful adventure. One of the highlights of my life, anyway. <laughs>